You guys are ready for some great storytellers, everybody, huh? Yeah, yeah. Is Caitlin in there? Ben, do you see Caitlin at all? She's going to be here because I saw her, so she's, she's on her way. But uh, what I'm going to do is bring up to the stage my, my wonderful guest. I wanted to have him on the show for, for some time. And uh, you know, he was a, a former editor at The Onion. He's done stuff for uh, Adult Swim. He does all these things. I don't even know what they are. He did this thing, Thing X. This is hilarious website. I don't even know what it was, but I would just go in there and laugh. Uh, but he's a great guy, and uh, he's hilarious, and I'm glad he finally, uh, that we finally got on the video. Let's welcome Joe Randazzo. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Let's loosen up a little, guys, huh? Let's loosen up. Fine, that was some great... Not, not racist, but it was like on the edge of racist stuff. But he did it in front of real agents, and that's the true mark of non-racist. Uh, this is a good mic. Feels good in the hand, and there's a nice warmth coming out of the sound system, which is surprising for Brooklyn Brewery. How's everybody doing? It's really nice to be here. I drove down uh, this afternoon just for this. I recently moved to Connecticut, actually, uh, in May. Um, not the like shitty, rich part of Connecticut that you guys probably live in, um, but Northern Connecticut, which is um, right on the Massachusetts border, it's sort of the like, rich, racist part of Connecticut. Uh, but we recently moved there from Brooklyn in May, and um, I started doing all these uh, dad-type type homeowner sort of uh, things, which I never had used to do before, but they were very satisfying things to do. Um, taking care of the lawn, weeding, which is a very therapeutic activity. Is anybody weed? <laughs> and for some of you have weeded. Uh, it's extremely therapeutic. There are these vines that were actually wrapping around my house and sort of growing through the um, wood paneling. And I eventually found the like head vine, like the like master vine, um, and celebrated. And it was like fuck. Fuck you! When I finally killed it, I wasn't able to rip it out of the ground, but I severed it and chopped it up and burned it. Um, which is the kind of stuff that I've been doing. And um, <clears throat> I've been putting all my creative energy toward these sorts of activities. And I recently started renovating uh, our kitchen, um, which is what I'm going to tell you about tonight. But I, I, it's not really. Not really. Uh, but when Tom first asked me to do the show nine years ago, I said, I can't do it this month. Let's do it in September of 2014 when I have a little more life experience and something uh, that I'd like to confess to people. Um, which is what I'm going to do as long as I don't put out, which I often do. If this thing is going south at all, I'm going to bail and start telling strip club stories. Um, are you guys doing all right over there? Do you need a drink or anything? Got their own thing going on. Um, so I've been renovating this. I, I just started, um, we bought this old house. It's kind of a weird old farmhouse um, that was owned previously by this sort of, I guess, psychotic people who had huge dogs and the walls are all scratched up and the doors were scratched up and everything we've heard from the neighbors is that they would often scream at each other uh, and that the husband used to be very nice until he fell off the roof and hurt his head and then he turned into a very mean person and it sounds like it was very tragic but we got the house cheap and so I started um, ripping out I started ripping out the cabinets one day I had been helping I'm sorry I can't actually hear myself as you guys are speaking kind of loudly if you don't mind Thank you. It's just hard to concentrate. Um, not that I need to hear myself, but just for the reverb and stuff. Uh, so I had started ripping out the cabinets because I have these friends who are much more adventurous about that kind of stuff. And I was like, fuck it, I'm going to rip out the cabinets. Uh, 
uh, and the linoleum flooring, and I had no idea what I'm doing because I've never done any of this uh, stuff before at all. Um, but I found all kinds of interesting things under the cabinets. There's a lot of marbles, uh, gum wrappers, there was a sobriety card, like, congratulations, kind of thing. I told the story, very, very sad story, and I uh, found um, mouse skeletons uh, on one of those uh, sticky traps, which I think is the worst way to die. There were about 16 of them, uh, sort of a Pompeii, like a mouse Pompeii situation under there. Um, and then I ripped up the linoleum, and my wife noticed that under the uh, subfloor there was hardwood floor, so I ripped all that up. And um, then we noticed that there was a sort of like greenish flaky material, and my wife uh, Googled asbestos, and we, uh, got, we, we got out of the house and went to a burger uh, shop and started crying, and then I did a, some more Googling of asbestos myself, scraped it all off with one of those, uh, like, got one of those sort of uh, ET suits, like the suits they wear at the end of ET. Is that part of ET? You guys have all seen ET, right? Um, and scraped it all up, and it's been this whole process, a very rewarding process, and I, and I sort of love doing it, but I've taken on this like um, martyr complex about it, where I, I I constantly want recognition for it from my wife and children um, to tell me what a good job that I've been doing and how great it is that I've sacrificed um, my career, my knees, and everything for this kitchen. And I've been, you know, it's sort of caused. Even though I really enjoy it, um, and it's it's very fun and fulfilling. It brings out this, like, I don't know what baby, I guess, in the asshole, uh, where I feel that I should be getting acknowledged for all the work that I have voluntarily decided to do. And I've been trying to think about why, and, and, and we just recently had a second child uh, a month ago. And I'm thinking, like, why can't you just say at least thank you or something, you know? Like, <laughs> This is for you. Um, and it, it got me thinking, like, we had him in New York, even though we had moved to Connecticut. Our first child, um, Cormac, he's six years old now. He was a hallmark because we were in Brooklyn at the time. Uh, I was expecting a younger, more slovenly, homebirth friendly crowd tonight. Um, I, shaved my I shaved the back of my neck for tonight's show. It was about as deep as I got with the preparedness. Now, living in Connecticut is different. I have I'm very good at small talk, like a weird store, hardware store small talk. I'm like really good at now, which I've never been good at before. So he was a home birth, and it was, a, it was a really an incredible experience. He came about 10 or 11 days late. My mother had, had been there. My, we thought my wife's water had broken, and so my mother drove down from New Hampshire because we were going to have her be our doula, and a doula is a lady who, um, she, well, we're very, I'm very close to her, and so is my wife. A doula is a lady who um, has snacks for you, and then, you know, it's $1,400 for her to be there. Um, and my mom brought snacks, too. She made English muffin for pizza. Uh, so, but, but then, so what happened was my mother was there for 11 days, with me and my wife waiting, just waiting for this fucking baby to come. And he finally came after my wife ate two uh, uh, egg McMuffin sandwiches and went to the bathroom and then a pop happened. And about four hours later we had a, a son. And it went really great. We didn't know what he was going to be. The only hiccup was that he almost died um, because he came out so quickly uh, that he was having trouble breathing. So we didn't even really get the chance to have that chest-to-chest, -chest, uh, you know, skin-to-skin, skin-so-soft -skin, um, thing that you want to have with a baby, because our, uh, there, was, there was a midwife there. <laughs> uh, we didn't wing it. Uh, she was there, and she was sweating bullets, you know, she had this sort of, like, gas, uh, oxygen mask over him, and was really rubbing his, his skin, and he wasn't really breathing or crying or anything like that. And we were like, whoo, that was good, that was a good birth. Um, 
is he gonna live or is he, you know, is this is he gonna die? And, uh, he lived. Um, and I think the whole experience was still overall very rewarding. And it was sort of summed up. Uh, we had this 19-year-old cat named Zeno, who was actually the subject of an onion headline, Cat Refuses to Die. He was, my wife had had him since she, since she was in fifth grade, and he had died once when she was away in Seattle. I swear he died. And I was trying to figure out how to tell my wife, uh, and I went out to just sort of think about it, and then I came back, and he was lying in the bed dead, and then just went, and came back to life. He came back to life. So he was there, we've been through this beautiful process, very, a lot of emotions, up and down, and I was holding the baby who was breathing like, he was okay, but breathing like a cartoonish Irish drunk. And my wife is having her um, vagina stitched up by the midwife while my mother is making calls, and uh, in the bowl is the placenta which we thought, hey, let's dry it and eat it. If we're going to do this whole thing, let's make a placenta shake. And um, there was the 19-year-old cat, Zeno, um, almost getting his head into the bowl, almost knocking it over the counter, and I had to like, scoop up the baby and like, kick Zeno away. And it was a great day, overall. But that evening, um, my, my mother had left, and the midwife had left, and after all this time, waiting for this baby in this, this sort of highly emotional afternoon and evening of, of having him. There was nobody left. It was just the three of us. And we were lying in bed. We had this new baby. And I finally had a chance to sort of let it all sink in. And it was a really cold night in October. It was un unseasonably cold even for October here. And I, I couldn't help it, but there this thought came into my head, which was, why don't you take the baby and put him outside to die in the cold? Which I did not do at all. I didn't do it. For one thing, she had a tight grip on that kid, like you would not believe. Um, but it was just this really sickening thought that came up in my head that I did not, I wasn't even thinking it, it was just sort of like, it was just an impulse, like this weird, ancient impulse that was remove that child, remove that child from your life. And I felt so guilty about it. Um, and I love him, I love him very much, and I have no ill will toward him or desire to kill him, but I've never told anybody this before because it's so shameful feeling uh, to eliminate him, my newborn son, who I love more than life itself. Um, and my second child, He's fine. He's six. He's a great kid, my first child. Our second kid we decided to have here in the city, even though we had been in Connecticut, because um, we had a great obstetrician who we sort of, you know, we had some ups and downs trying to get pregnant. I was doing great. Um, I, you know, but uh, we found this great obstetrician who's this wonderful guy. I wanted to keep him. He's like my favorite guy who, you know, puts his hand in my wife's vagina for money of anybody that I know at all. Top five, top five. And we decided to keep him. And so we were enjoying our, you know, beautiful rural summer and we came down to New York uh, for August to have him, which was thankfully a mild summer of August. But it was a much different experience. Um, we did it at a hospital, we did it at NYU, which I can recommend to anybody to think about having children, a wonderful facility. And it was in the middle of the night, and the obstetrician that we had come to New York uh, to have put his hand in my wife's vagina one last time was not even available, he wasn't on duty. And it was just a team of strangers, doctors there, and, and nurses and other professionals, who, um, who delivered our baby. And it was just this amazing experience. It was so different than the first one. And again, my wife, Kat, amazing at having children. It's like she should do it professionally or whatever. If that is, I don't know if that is, but I guess that's a thing. In China probably, right Tom? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and she is so incredible at it. She, just, she, ground, you know, she, she grounds the whole experience. She's so strong and beautiful, incredibly beautiful both times is what I've been struck by. It's how gorgeous she looks um, doing this. And this time it was with you know this other team that was really inspiring to 
be surrounded by all these people who are there to help you who don't know you in one of the most important experiences of your life. And um, he finally came out, and I was like, that was great, right? You know, like, that was so easy. Um, it, would, you know, it wasn't as easy for my wife, but he finally came out, and I just started laughing because it's incredible when the, when the baby's actually there. Uh, it's just so ridiculous. It's like there's nothing, 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 and then there's a human. And he also looks exactly like my father, we're missing halfway, half, halfway out of the birth canal, uh, which was disturbing but funny as well. Because my dad has like a big nose, and like a Groucho uh, Marx style nose, and eyeglasses, and mustache, and stuff. So it's a funny image to see on the baby. Um, not for the written jokes. I, uh, so then, then I was there just sort of like basking in the magic of this all, and I had this same thought that I had had when my first son was born. You know, but it was August, so I could not throw him out in the cold, but, and there's tons of security at this hospital anyway. Um, I checked. But I had this thought, and I was like, God damn it, I was just looking at him like, Tara. It wasn't that I wanted to, to do that, but I just sort of wanted him, and this is fleeting, both times a fleeting thought. I'm not a psychopath, I don't think. But I just wanted him to not be there. It's sort of like if you're having sex and it's going really great, and then you come to fruition as a man, and then you're just like, oh, this is all disgusting, and you realize how gross it all is, and just want it to end. Has anybody else ever felt that way, or is that just me? Don't answer. Thank you for clapping. Thanks for clapping. It was sort of like that. The reality sunk in. And, um, Again, I just felt like shit, but then I started thinking about it. I was like, well, this must be why chimpanzees eat their young, or whatever it is that eats their young, um, or, or the Irish, or whoever it is. Whatever, the animals that eat their young, and why dads feel this sort of resentment toward their children, and why people in Arkansas let their kids shoot Uzis. You know, it's because they're here to replace us. And partly, we are like, fuck you for that. You know, we have a kind of innate, I think, desire to not be replaced. And so we, one of our impulses, an old reptilian impulse, is to do away with, with the child in the hope that maybe we'll be able, maybe, maybe, maybe we won't die. Maybe I'll be able to have sex again, and it will mean something. Um, which is not going to happen. Um, but it's, it's a, it's kind of a disturbing reality, I think, that we all have, you know, like, because staring at your, at your child is sort of like staring at your own demise in a way, and showing them a lot of affection is sort of like, you know, tickling, tickling your execution, you know? It's like your own mortality is just looking at you, making you wipe fecal matter out of its asshole, out of its ass, you know? Um, of its little cute little tushy, cute little tushy wishy, because you can't help but loving your children and their little tushies either. Uh, because even though you know there is all that about the fact that they're there to replace you, you you kind of want them to do a good job, and, and, and you love them for that. And uh, you know, realizing this sort of made me have some forgiveness for my dad. Not that he did anything bad, but. You know, besides never really showing me any affection in my whole life, but just like we're all sort of here to be replaced, and that's sort of a, a, a ridiculous cycle. I think if you just give into, maybe there's a kind of a poignancy in that. Um, and in that respect, I think with my babyishness around doing all the home renovations and tearing out cabinets and stuff sort of makes sense because it's like I'm doing this for you guys, and you're fucking basically strangling you to death by being alive, you know? But there's also a real freedom in having a baby, someone that you can act any way you want with, or be any way you want with, and sort of look deeply into their eyes, and feel absolutely no judgment, which is not possible with any other human beings. So I think if I am a little bit pissy about renovating the kitchen, it's because I want a little bit of credit for the fact that 
I'm just here to be replaced, and I'm still ripping out cabinets. I like to think of it, the kitchen thing is really more for my wife, and she's the one who got me into this fucking mess to begin with. So thank you very much for having me. I hope my story inspires you to have children.
it's not a huge step. Like, oh, they'll be coming out, whatever. It's like, all right, baby's born. Let's get on with this thing, yeah. So I just thought that was good. She was, she was good. My daughters are great. Right? They're eight and five. I think I'm raising kids in New York City, and I too, like, I was afraid of my dad, but that's the way life was supposed to be, you know. And I thought, oh, good. these kids are growing up in New York. They're gonna be so like New Yorky, right? You know, but New Yorkers are not tough. Was anyone born in New York? No, you all came here from somewhere else, right? <laughs> we think we're so cool. We come here from somewhere else. We're like, yeah, we came to New York for a reason. You know, like, we're here. We're supposed to be here. And New Yorkers were like, you, you were born here. What good is that, man? But my daughters are growing up in New York. But I went down the park. This was like classic. It shows you I'm like, I think I'm raising good kids. And I don't even try that hard. I took my daughter down the park in this jungle gym. And she starts climbing up. It's just me and her in the city park in Riverdale, Bronx, New York. She's on the jungle gym. And then this other New York guy shows up with his son. So he starts playing. So it's just me and you know two New York dads and the two kids. And so of course me and the New York dad just ignore each other. It was like, you know, checking the email. Which is not what we do as 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 parents, we're always like with our kids, we're like, share, play, play. Everyone has to play, everyone has to share. And then it's like, no, I'm not talking about that. No, no, no. So they're on the jungle gym, and at some point my daughter's like, bang, bang, bang. And then the son returns fire, he's like, bang, 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 bang. bang. So they're back and forth, bang, 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 bang. And the New York dad almost dropped his phone. He came running over, he's like, Dean, no guns. And the son is like, sorry, dad. And my daughter climbed down off the jungle gym, and she walks up to the New York dad, and she goes, it's not real. And the guy looked at me and I was like, she's right, it's not real. There was no question, she was, she was right on the facts. I thought that was conscientious the way she showed both sides of the flesh gun. It shows she's polite. Uh, we have more show, more storytelling. You guys excited? Yes? Let's welcome to the show. A great comedian. I'm so glad I got her on the show, Caitlin Bailey. 